I'm so glad you're here and we're recording in progress. <laughs> and so glad that you're here with us today. Um, we are so proud to be kicking off a week of jewelry making with Michael's Creative Classroom and um, just pleased as punch that you could be here with us. So I want to show you what I'm going to be making and then we'll get right started with the projects. Um, this is the Primo and Souffle multi-pack that I'm focusing on for making these super cute little Grand Canyon S earrings. I'm going to show you all about color mixing. We're really going to get into how to mix colors to create a family of colors that look great together, all from Primo and Souffle. And then also we're going to be doing a couple, um, a pair of earrings featuring Liquid Sculpey and some extra findings from Michaels. And Liquid Sculpey uh, looks like this on the shelf. I'm going to show you how to work with it, how to use it in a mold, and how to finish the earrings. So Maria, if you're ready, if you could put me on the overhead, um, we will get started with our making our projects. First, I want to take a look at making the liquid Sculpey um, pieces. And I made these using a mold that is available at Michael's. Here's what it looks like in the package. This is um, actually a resin craft mold, but it's a silicone mold. This particular um, item that I'm using even came with like a little handful of findings to finish your pieces. And this is a silicone mold. That means it can go right in your home oven. And all of our um, products from Sculpey, Liquid Sculpey, Primo, Souffle, they need to be baked in a home oven to make them permanently cured. And so silicone molds like these can go right in your home oven and then you just pop the piece out and finish it. So to get started with that, I have a clean mold right here. And silicone molds come in lots of colors. If you see them on the internet, sometimes they're pink or turquoise. Um, ours from Sculpey are gray. Um, these just happen to be clear. And if they're silicone and they're rated to like 350 or 400 degrees, then they're fair game for liquid Sculpey. So this is a one ounce bottle of liquid Sculpey and this is Pearl. And I just want you to know that before you use liquid Sculpey, you wanna get in there and stir it up and just make sure it's all, all the ingredients are playing well together and mixed just like you would a batter. You would mix it before you pour it in the pan. And then I'm just trying to get as much of that great product back in the bottle as I possibly can because I don't like to waste it. So like I said, this is Pearl. And I'm also going to be focusing on our translucent turquoise, which is this super light sort of uh, sky color. And we are going to use the Pearl to make this third color this orangish um, coral color in here, we're gonna tint some of our pearl with alcohol ink. So I wanna actually do that first. I'm gonna put the lid back on and the lid on these bottles is adjustable. So I'm opening it completely up as far as it will go. Next, I have a little silicone um, baking liner that is in the baking department. And I'm just gonna put enough um, of the pearl in the bottom of this little liner that I want to tint with some alcohol ink. Now I want to make sure I put enough in there to make all these different areas with the with the um, sort of the coral color because I don't want to have to go back and match it later. I want to make sure I get enough for the whole project. So uh, the bottom of this cup is about the size of a quarter. And I would say I've filled it to about two quarters full. And what, what I mean by a quarter is the actual coin a quarter. All right, this is pinata ink and it's an alcohol-based ink that works really well with liquid Sculpey. And so I'm just gonna put a drop in here. Actually two drops went in, it's very runny, runny. This is Calabaza orange, but when I mixed it with the pearl, it made a really nice coral. Now I've just got one of my Sculpey clay tools and I picked this tool because it's flat across the bottom and it can get on the bottom of that cup and stir my color in really well. So you wanna go very sparingly with the pinata ink because it's very um, color saturated. It's very, very strong and you don't need a lot of it to affect a color change um, in this pearl liquid Sculpey. So that's a really pretty um, coral color. It's not 
you know, it's not as orange as the name on the ink would indicate. I think it's a really pretty and very popular um, coral. So I have that mixed up and ready to go. Next, I'm gonna pull my mold in front of me and I'm gonna clean off this tool. You can clean off um, Liquid Sculpey with paper towel or with baby wipes. So easy to work with. And then I'll put my tool aside. Okay, what I wanna do is mark out some areas where I'm gonna actually drop in um, some of this pearl color. I'm sorry, what? Wrong shape. Oh, thanks, Jen. <laughs> I, did the wrong, I almost did the wrong shape. Thank you, Jen. <laughs> Last week we did this shape. Yeah, Today we're doing correct. this shape. <laughs> I'm only human, right? Okay, each of these shapes has a post in it. And it's a little flexible post right here at the top of each shape. And that provides with a, a built-in hole that makes it so easy for you to add jump rings later after the piece is baked. So I always start um, right up next to that post just to make sure I get the liquid Sculpey all around it. Then I'm gonna mark out five total dots in my little mold. This is a rounded corner square. And I'm just kind of going at this randomly. And I want to do the same thing to both of them. And you can do this as like symmetrical as you like, or you can be really unsymmetrical with it. All right. So I'm just putting some drops in there of the white. Next, I'm going to go in with my translucent uh, turquoise. Now I've already stirred this one off camera. You always want to stir your liquids before you use them. And I'm just going to put snug some translucent turquoise dots right up next to these pearl ones. And you don't have to do it exactly the same. I'm making kind of a random effect because our theme on the jewelry making this week is a wonderlust. And to me, that kind of speaks of a freedom and you know doing things your own way. And so I'm not gonna be real particular about making these super symmetric. All right, I've got pearl dots and I have translucent turquoise dots. Next, since this isn't no longer in a squirt bottle, I'm just gonna use my tool and I'm gonna pick a scoop up there and I'm gonna let it drip right in place uh, between the dots of the other colors. Now at this point, I'm not being real, um, I'm not trying overly hard to fill up the mold. I'm just marking the space for each color. So if it's not level in the mold, that's fine for now. Jen, you are typing, typing, typing. Let's have some good questions or- Where they can find material. Oh, good, what okay. Kind of, what kind of mold they can handle. Just yeah, excellent. Cause molds come in a variety. You can get like fondant molds, um, those, a lot of those are silicone. Chocolate making molds are silicone these days. Soap making, bath bombs. Um, resin has really brought, resin art has brought so many molds to the forefront. And like I said earlier, as long as they're silicone, um, it, they're fair game for putting in your oven and, and making liquid Sculpey products. And there's so many jewelry shapes out there and also a lot of really cool home decor um, shapes, like for making coasters or um, what else? Things like that, that you can really get going with, with the product and make really cool designs for home. And Liquid Sculpey is so easy to tint and shade and blend mix colors that you can totally mix up to match your home decor or any theme that you have going. So lots and lots of fun and instant gratification when you uh, bake it in your home oven. All right, so right now I have like lots of little areas of all three colors marked out. And I wanna clean my hands really quick because I've got some on my fingertips. So I'm just gonna use a paper towel. Okay, next what I wanna do is go back in here with my pearl and my translucent turquoise. I'm gonna put pearl on top of pearl Amy, can you talk about baking in your home oven and how safe it is? Yeah, it's totally safe to bake in your home oven. I've been doing that for over 30 years with 
both Sculpey and Liquid Sculpey. Um, I also have a dedicated home oven. I have a dedicated oven in my studio. Um, it's, a, it's actually a fancy toaster oven. It's a Hamilton Beach toaster oven. And I use that daily when I'm in my studio. Um, I have two of those because I have one set um, to 275 for Primo, Souffle, and Sculpey 3. I have another one that I keep at 300 because I like to um, cook my liquid Sculpeys at a little bit higher temperature. So I only, anymore, I just use my kitchen oven if I have really oversized projects. But when I first started, my kitchen oven was all I had and I baked in it around, you know, almost daily. And as long as you're controlling your time and temperature um, and you're not burning the liquid Sculpey, it's completely um, non-toxic and it's no problem um, to use your home oven. Okay, now I'm tapping to make sure I'm releasing any trapped air bubbles. And my little dots have kind of, are they're kind of flattening out and filling up the mold. I do have the mold filled completely to level at this point, because if I fill it to level, I get this thickness of a finished earring. And I really like that. I think it's a nice um, size and thickness. And Liquid Sculpey is just so lightweight and flexible that um, if you fill it all the way to level, it doesn't add hardly any weight to your earrings. So I have my colors in. Next, I'm gonna swirl them gently together with a needle tool. And um, this is a sharp pointed tool. And so I'm just gonna dip it into, I'm gonna start with this orange or this uh, coral area, cause you can see it the most. What I'm gonna do is dip it in there and then I'm gonna drag the coral off into the next color and see how it makes really cool swirls. You can drag from one color to another, uh, you can lift up and start dragging anew, or you can just drag all the way around like I'm doing right here. And I'm changing direction sometimes because I want these to be real freestyle. Okay. Then you can just wipe the tip off uh, with paper towel. I'm going to go back in here and put some more of this coral out into this area. So let me see if I can show you this under the camera a little bit better. So I have, this one is already swirled and this one I haven't swirled yet. And you can just see what a great difference that makes. Um, and so now I just wanna go in here and do the same thing to this shape. And just keep dragging in random sort of, you know, back and forth. Um, swirls. You can swirl as much or as little as you want. I'm not swirling a lot because I want to maintain each color's character. I don't want to actually blend my colors. And then I'm going to tap it again because right there was a what I could see that air bubble was wanting to release and it popped quickly when I started tapping. If you see air bubbles surface and they don't want to release, you can just go in with your needle tool and poke them and make them go away. So that is a lot of fun. Now, if you wanted to, you can totally go ahead and fill these other areas of the mold. You can put the whole mold right in the oven all at the same time, completely full. It's probably what I would do at home in my studio. I would get it really full and make a lot of pieces at once. Um, I'm going to go ahead and clean this tool off. I want to give you a couple baking tips. So. This is a baking pan that goes right in my toaster oven. And one thing, another thing about ovens is you wanna make sure with an oven thermometer that they are very accurate. Um, 275 is what we bake um, the Primo and Souffle. And with liquid Sculpey, I like to bake at right about 300. Okay, so here's a baking tip for use with thin, um, of an silicone molds. I want to show you another style of mold that this works really well. This is the Sculpey jewelry mold. It also has those little posts, but when you look at it from the side, it's only about a quarter of an inch thick. This is what I call a thin mold. And I've developed this technique where I get my, um, um, either a dishcloth or this is a little tiny hot pad. I get this completely wet. Then I wring out as much of the water as I possibly can. I lay this down nice and flat 
and then I put my mold right on top. Now what that does is it helps the mold, the entirety of the mold bake at the same rate. Whereas if you put it directly on this very thin pan, the outside of the mold can bake quicker than the inside of your design. And what that will cause, is it may cause the mold to warp and nobody wants that to happen. So I've created this little cushy barrier of dampness and I put my mold right on top and my pieces come out nice and flat and level every single time. That will go in your home oven for 30 minutes um, following the baking instructions that come with all of our products. So I'll set that aside for now and then I'll show you how to deal with your pieces after they're baked. I'm going to put a paper towel down just because I feel like you can see better with a white background. All right, these pieces were already baked in my home oven and all you have to do is flex the mold and they come right out. Now the back has those dots that we outlined and the front is the side where we did the marble swirling. So just flex the mold and pull it right out. And like I said, these are very flexible and very durable and they feel really nice. They're not heavy. So sometimes when you're using a mold, you might notice that um, like right here, can you see that little bit of liquid Sculpey that's sticking up? That got stuck around the post. And so all I have to do is take some really sharp scissors and just trim that off. If you have any areas along the edge where the liquid might have um, stuck to the side of the mold, you can just trim that off with very sharp craft scissors. And I just like to touch them up because this is a handmade piece. And even though I keep talking about it being very freestyle, I still want it to be a nice quality piece when I give these earrings to someone. So just double check, feel for rough edges, see if it needs a little trimming before you add your jewelry findings. Okay, since I have these right in front of me, I think I'll go ahead and finish them with some findings um, so that you can see how that's done. So I have um, my boss, Jen, she found this at Michael's. It's such a cool thing. It's like three metal pieces that are already hooked together by jump rings. Well, we took it apart to get these <laughs> because in our finished design, we kind of wanted to add an, a metal element to the top, which just gives you a really nice um, mixed media look. Hey, Amy, yeah. quick, can mm -hmm. you talk about why you use scissors and not sandpaper? When you oh them? yeah, that's a great question. Um, sandpaper doesn't really work with liquid Sculpey very well. Um, the See how flexible the liquid Sculpey is? That is just incredibly hard to sandpaper that off. Now, if you do resin, which is super rigid and, and hard, you would sandpaper that. Um, but with liquid Sculpey, you can just trim, trim right along the edges. And because the color is part of the liquid, even where you trim, it, the, the color stays, um, it keeps its integrity and stays that color. Um, I know that if you trimmed or cut resin like that, it would form a white line on the edge, but that doesn't happen with liquid Sculpey. So this is just so quick and easy. I find the rubbery texture of the liquid Sculpey incredibly difficult to sand. So that's why I do that. And that was a great question. Next, I'm gonna show you how to open a jump ring. So I, I like to use two pairs of flat nose pliers to open a jump ring. And I'm gonna come over here. And I always put the opening of the jump ring facing upward toward my face. And then I twist one pair of pliers toward me and one away to open the jump ring. So jump rings always open by twisting like this you don't ever want to stretch a jump ring like that, okay? If you stretch them, you'll have a really hard time getting them to go back to um, a nice shape that looks good and will stay closed. So I'm just threading that through and then I'll put my uh, metal piece on the top. And then I'm gonna do the opposite. I twist one away from me and one toward me to get those completely lined up. I even go past the lineup point just a little bit. I go past and then I let it come back. And you want those two sides of the jump ring to meet you know, evenly right there. So that's how I attach the metal piece. And then for the ear wire, I'm just pulling that little ball up with my fingernail. So ear wires have, a lot of times have this little ball down here. And I just pull that back with my fingernail and then I just gently open again by twisting that little eye 
and then put that right through the metal piece at the top. And that's just a really beautiful and cute uh, mixed media design. Then I twisted that eye back and then let the little ball fall back down to hold it closed. So I'm trying to get to a place where you can see what I'm doing. So then I would just finish um, the other earring in exact same manner. And I would have a pair of earrings ready to, to wear or to give. So really cute um, little liquid Sculpey earrings. Okay, let's move on to, oh, I also wanted to give you another baking tip. So I would use, if I had leftover of my color that I made, um, I might dump that into um, a mold or try to make as many usable pieces as I could with that extra color. I would definitely use it all up. And then when you're down to the bare minimum, that can go right in the oven with your project, just like that. And when your silicone baking cup comes out of the oven, you can just peel away that residue and the cup's ready to use again. All right, now we can move on to our Primo slash souffle um, Grand Canyon-esque so earrings. Can you, yeah. Can you talk about if someone wanted a shiny coat on the earrings, like a clay? Oh, okay, if you wanted them shiny. Mm -hmm. um, actually, um, you could uh, you could either paint these with Sculpey Glossy Glaze, which is also available at Michael's, correct, Jen? Yes. Sculpey yes. Glossy Glaze. Gl uh, glossy Glaze, it comes in glossy or matte. Mm -hmm. um, you could also go back over this with a layer of our clear liquid Sculpey, which is super duper clear. I have, I happen to have a pair of earrings I made here last Thursday, and this these need to be trimmed. This is the clear liquid Sculpey, but they're so shiny and they have um, flowers, dried flowers embedded in them. Clear liquid Sculpey makes a super nice um, glossy glaze, um, or you could hit it with a heat gun, just um, bring up the heat and go over this and it will actually take a shine on its own from heat gun. Uh, we have a lot of tutorials um, on YouTube about using a heat gun with liquid Sculpey, so. And can you quickly talk about other things you can mix in with a liquid Sculpey? Oh, okay. Sand, yeah, flowers. so that was um, dried flowers that I mixed in there. Like Jen said, mentioned you could mix in sand. I also have this pair of earrings we made in the last class on Thursday. This has foils mixed in and glitter. Let me put it on here so you can see it. There's no color in this. This is clear liquid Sculpey and the glitter is all the color that you see. Um, alcohol ink, mica powder, sand or herbs. Um, you could put your own dried flowers in to make a, a keepsake or a piece of memorabilia. So anything that can survive the 275 degree oven can go into our products and be permanently embedded in them. So, okay, I just slid this out because I wanna show you this package is half Primo and half souffle. These are one ounce bars. The Primo pieces have a lot of cool inclusions like um, glitter and mica and different special effects. And the souffle colors are all matte. And so I wanna show you how I mixed all these up to create these super cool colors that I got here for mimicking the look of the Grand Canyon. So what I did was I divided my bars and I used um, in every color, I used frost white glitter. And what I, the reason I'm mixing these colors up is to create sort of a matching DNA throughout every color. Every color I mixed the same colors together and that gave me a family of colors that looks super cool. So every color has some frost white glitter, every color has some rose gold glitter, and then each color has the purity of its own color. And that came from the souffle. So these are the souffle colors I used. I used um, cherry pie, um, pumpkin, canary, turnip. I also used shamrock, but I already have that color pre-mixed here. So I'm not gonna go over that one again. And I also used some igloo souffle, which is just a really flat white. And you're gonna notice that when I made these colors, um, so each color gets a block, a one eighth block of frost white glitter. And then each color gets a 16th piece of souffle. 
Now, let me show you what I mean by a, a souffle igloo. Let me show you what I mean by a 16th. So these one ounce bars come in that package together. If you cut this in half, that's a half. If you cut it in fourths, that's a fourth. If you cut the fourths down, that's an eighth, which is what my frost white glitter lumps are. If you cut the eighths in half, you get a sixteenth. And that's how big a sixteenth is. So for the rose gold, um, I have one sixteenth of rose gold for every color in the DNA. So I need another sixteenth here for my fourth color. There, I'm just setting these all up so you can see how easy it is. Each color got a sixteenth of igloo, and then. I cut those down again and got a 32nd. And that's how much color you need of, this one is um, cherry pie. This one is pumpkin. This one is canary. So I am really muting these colors down because they are so super saturated. And I really want this beautiful sort of pastel sunset effect. This one is turnip. And that's the recipe I used for each one. So then we just get in here with our hands and start mixing. Now you can mix by hand or you can use a pasta machine um, or you can use a clay roller. So if you mix by hand, just move from the outside of the ball to the inside, just working that right around. And you wouldn't think this rose gold glitter would be a likely candidate for color mixing, but what the rose gold glitter does is it adds a warmth to each color, plus it adds some glitter. And that ties everything together to have that same warmth going um, through each one. I love to use the glitter colors, even my frost white glitter, which is this bigger lump, the, pro the majority of the colors actually the frost white glitter and it has um, glitter in it as well, obviously by the name. And so if you could look at these earrings up close and you know from side to side, you would see that they actually have a lot of glitter in them. Now you can mix um, your own glitters into our, our solid clays or even our liquid clays to achieve you know, just myriads and myriads of color designs that you can make um, for yourself based on your own color palette and your own, uh, your own like. So this is the turnip one, which is going to make this very bottom color. Now, another thing I like to do is a lot of times I'll stop mixing when there's still lumps of color in there, because I think it adds just so much interest to the color if you don't blend it completely solid. So that's the one we need for the bottom. And I'll do the canary one next. And I wanna show you how some tips for blending colors. That one I did completely with my, my fingertips. This one I'm gonna show you a rolling technique where you just get in here and really start rolling these colors together. And it's really your body heat and the energy from your body that's going through here and really helping it soften and mix. And then I can roll it some more. These um, glitter colors, we also, this is a rose gold glitter. We also have um, a yellow gold glitter in the same package and we have white gold glitter. And each one, if you use them to tone your colors, um, provides a different um, you know, outcome. The rose gold and the yellow gold both, both kind of warm your colors. And then the white gold will cool your colors. So um, like I said earlier, I love to use it in mixing because um, it provides a tint and helps all these colors come together in like a color family. Amy, can you talk a little bit about if the clay gets hard, how do they soften it? Sure. Um, if you have clay that has gotten hard, um, we have a product called um, 
Sculpey clay softener. Is that what it's called in the bar, Jen, or yeah. <laughs> the bar of it? Mm -hmm. um, if I'm going to soften solid clays, which what I mean by a solid clay is that it comes in a bar. It doesn't come in a bottle. If I'm going to soften bar clays, um, I really like to use the bar softener and just a little bitty pinch of our Sculpey clay softener. And you can use it to soften any, any bar of polymer clay. And you just work it in right like I'm doing now. And it will take immediate effect. Um, you want to blend it in as best as you possibly can. And you can even blend it in with a pasta machine. And you just want to get it completely worked in until you've achieved the consistency that you want. So you want to blend in a tiny bit at a time and then um, add more as needed. So this one, I have all the colors kind of working together. So I want to show you a rolling technique for blending colors. You just use a, this is the acrylic clay roller and you can just flatten the clay and keep folding it. And here again, I love all those intermediate blends that you get before you get to completely blended because they have so much interest, um, almost like granite or stone. There's so many lines in there that are all different and I just think it looks so cool. You would also do this exact same thing if you're mixing with a pasta machine that you would fold your piece in half and then you would run the fold of the clay sheet through the machine first. And then that would allow you to press air bubbles out um, as, you're, as you're working through a pasta machine. So folding and putting the fold through first if you have a pasta machine that you wanna use. Can you talk about cleaning your hands, like how to get the color out? Yeah, so some colors will transfer, like we're probably gonna see when I get to the next one, which is cherry pie. Uh, a lot of the red colors, it's very typical that it's going to transfer to your hands. And what I would do, like between colors, is I would just, um, you can use paper towel to just dry clean your hands like so. But if you're using colors that are more stubborn, you can use um, baby wipes and just pull that right off um, your hands like, like that. Now, when you're all done, um, just wash your hands with um, soap and water and they will come completely clean. My tools, I hardly ever actually clean those. I just wipe them with either a paper towel or um, with baby wipes. All right, this one's the cherry pie. And remember, I used the same amount um, of each um, color. I'm used the same amount of the frost white glitter, of the igloo, the rose gold glitter. And then I used just a tiny pinch of each solid color of the souffle. And this one's going really quick too. So when you um, go to mixing colors, you can mix up as much or as little as you want for your recipe. Um, I've gotten to the point where I like to just mix up enough for the project, um, not have a whole lot extra. I do take notes on when I mix colors to try to, uh, you know, make sure that I, if I want to repeat the recipe that I can do that again. All right, I'm going to go to rolling this one a little bit and make it go a little bit quicker. And then we'll start on our, our earrings. I love using um, the Primo colors that have the glitter in them because it just adds a little bit of extra blinginess, but I kind of like the bling. <laughs> can right. you add your own glitter? Yep, you can add your own glitter or foil glitter or confetti glitter. Anything that'll go in the oven at 275 is, is fair game. Okay, so next, let's start with our 
actually you can start with any color, but I'm just gonna start with the canary because that's the one I used in the background. And I'm gonna clean my I'm gonna clean my hands one more time can since you I just show went with red. The cactus earrings? Yes, I, I sure will. Okay, I'll try to do that. And get myself clean and I'm gonna wipe my area here too, just to make sure I have the cherry pie uh, color off of there. All right, maybe. I wonder if it helps if I put them on a white background. So how does that look? Oh, good. Can you see? Yeah. Um, so I have that canary blend at the top. Right under it, I have a pumpkin blend, then the cherry pie, and then this bottom is the turnip. And then the cactus itself, I did the same recipe as before, and I used the shamrock souffle as my green tint. Now, right down here, I have some gray granite. I did not mix it. This is gray granite primo. That's what's happening there at the bottom. And then I just used some white for the little buds. Okay. So you could use whatever color you want for the backs. Um, I'm just going to build everything on the canary blend like I did in this sample. And so the first thing I need to do is roll my canary blend out really, really thin. And that's the great thing about Primo and Souffle. Those are our strongest clays. And you can roll it really thin and it still has enough integrity to hold itself and to hold its own body up um, as an earring, okay? So I just need to roll out enough that I can use my um, oval shaped cutters. And this is a little set of cutters that's available at Michael's. And these are all ovals, they're six, different ones and I use this largest one for my earring base, but you could scale down or up either way. Um, this is the largest one in this set. And so you just wanna make sure that you have enough of your background um, that you can get two of these out of the little sheet. My sheet here is very thin. It's less than an eighth of an inch thick. If you're using a pasta machine, it's probably about a number three on the pasta machine, okay? And I started out as thin as I could because um, I want my, these actually, as I layer my colors up, by the time I get to the bottom, it's kind of thick. So I started really thinly here at the top. Okay, next we want to do our um, pumpkin blend. And so I have it here and I'm gonna roll it super duper thin. with my roller and I tore it in half, but that's perfectly fine as you're gonna see because the shape I used to get these random like hills and you know shapes across the canyon there, I did by tearing. So what I could do is I can take advantage of that torn area and cut out a pumpkin and all you have to do is tap that down. Now let me show you, I'll just go ahead and tear this one. All I'm doing is starting on the edge and tearing, you know, a random line. It doesn't even have to be straight, but that's just kind of the effect I wanted um, in these earrings. Now, when I cut this, all that part where I'm not on the where I have no clay, that's representing the yellow that's gonna show out the top. So let me move my sheet just a little bit because I wanna get it more in the middle. Okay, so then this can go layered over here. And these, this pair of earrings is gonna be completely asymmetrical, but I think that's really cool for, you know, the subject matter of it being an outdoorsy um, canyon-like, um, you know, Piece. I think the it not matching is really cool. All right, this is the cherry pie blend. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to cut away less of this. I'll do it two times for each piece. And then I'm going to tear the edge. And then I'll line, I'm always lining the bottom up uh, across there with the maintaining, you know, the, the shape of the oval. And then I'm just tapping 
the top down. The cool thing about oven baked polymer clay is that it likes to stick to itself. And so there's no glue or anything. You just, just line the pieces up and then I'm using fingertip pressure to just tap them down like that. Now, if you would get like um, a wrinkle or a fingerprint or something, you can always go over each layer with your acrylic roller and just flatten them out again. And just make sure that, you know, you're not trapping air between each layer, that the layers are really coming into nice contact with each other, um, that it looks how you want it to. It's not gonna shrink or expand in the oven. And so however it goes in the oven, that's how it's coming out. So if you have an air bubble, you could pop that with a needle. Or if you have uneven layers, you're going to want to smooth those with your fingers or with a roller. Um, nothing goes away in the oven. It doesn't change. It doesn't shrink or expand. So get it how you want it and then go on from there. Okay, this is my last one. And since this is way down at the bottom, I'm just going to cut out one oval. I can get both pieces out of this one. And then I'm going to tear tear this and I'm kind of letting it tear, you know, real willy nilly so that I get those really different edges um, to my little Canyon pieces. So. Hey, Amy, can you yeah. talk a little bit about fingerprints? Yes. Okay. That one's too big. So I'm going to tear this one down some more. So um, I've always said that if you can see my fingerprints, that's my signature. <laughs> That's an original piece of art. But I understand completely that some people don't like fingerprints in their finished piece. So the roller is a really great way. Just go gently over it with the roller and that will eliminate fingerprints. And some people wear gloves. People can wear gloves if they want to. Um, another way that you can eliminate fingerprints, and let me see what I have here that I can show this to you. This is a little sheet of deli paper. And these come in super handy. If you want to burnish away fingerprints, just put this on the top of your clay and then burnish over it like so. And that will clear the fingerprints right away. And in this case, you would do it like to each layer as you're building. Another way to eliminate fingerprints is to douse a cotton swab. And this is a great tip for removing lint as well, dust and lint. Douse a cotton swab in a little bit of rubbing alcohol and just gently remove dirt and lint with the rubbing alcohol on a cotton swab, okay? All right, now I just wanna double check that I still have my shape is as nice as it was. And I don't know if you can see, but I have a little rim of extra clay. So I'm just gonna recut these because I feel like the bottom got a little bit out of shape and I want to preserve that really nice oval shape. So I'm just gonna recut them, especially if you rolled over um, each piece between every layer, they're gonna stretch a bit. And so just from the pressure that you apply, I've got some pieces, I'm picking this up to get rid of these little shavings on the edge. And then I'm gonna go around with my fingertips and make sure these are really, really smooth. Okay. I'm picking up all my little clay bits there. And then I'll just gently pull this one up and check the edges to make sure. I Anytime I use a cutter, I like to use my fingertips and kind of buff the edge so it doesn't have a hard a hardness to it. All right, now I'm just gonna gather up all my little shavings and get rid of them. Okay, so there's my two backgrounds. Next, we get to the really fun part of creating some cactus there in the foreground. I'm gonna double check my time. Oh, we got plenty of time. I'll just do one because I wanna make sure you know how to build your cactus. And I focused on what I call um, a bunny ear cactus. Um, I actually have bunny ear cactuses growing um, in, my, in my collection. So I know how they look and I feel like I can make them pretty well. <laughs> so that's why I made that kind. So what I like to do is just roll a little rope to get me started. And then I like to cut pieces off that are like, I'll have two bigger pieces and then I'll cut some really little ones to arrange little pads that go on the top. Then I just roll these into ovals with my fingers and that creates a really thick little oval. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna go for this one. 
And, but as I flatten it, I allow it to stretch out. And that only, not only cut, keeps it stretching out into the shape that I want, but it also helps adhere the little cactus um, to the background. And I'm applying more of these little pads and I'm kind of making it, I've got a little oval, but it's a little pointed on one end. And, and that's where my attachment point for each little pad is. Okay, so just add these as, met, as many as you want, as little or as big as you want. You could, this would also be cute with like a little saguaro design or whatever. These ones are real, I cut these down even smaller. So I'm going to put them together down here. Okay, now one trick I like to use for creating little prickles on the cactus is this is the tip of a Phillips screwdriver. I just pulled it out because this screwdriver is so big. And this is the tip. It makes a little tiny X. And I think that's a cute little uh, nod to prickles that would be on a cactus. You don't have to cover the whole thing, but just to give the hint that this guy's got some prickles on him, I think this is a cute way to do it. So I just put, make sure there's a few little prickles on each, on each and every pad with the, my Phillips screwdriver. Then you can take either your solid white igloo or you can take some frost white glitter and you just need the tiniest amount to make these teeny tiny little buds on the cactus and just roll this little rope out super skinny, cut off some little tiny pieces, put them on here. And the flowers all, all seem to come out of the top of the pads. So they're facing the sun. And this can make some cute little details. Not super like detailed, but just, just indicating that, hey, this is a cactus. It's got some little flowers ready to come out and greet you. And so it's just an indication of detail. It's not like every single detail. Then I like to take the tip of a tool like this. This has a blunt point and I just go back in here and give each little flower a seat with it. And that creates like a little bud hole and also helps connect that teeny tiny detail um, to the base layers underneath. So you're creating texture and pressure at the same time. Now, while I have this tool in hand, I'm gonna go ahead and put a hole right here. And that is for my earring finding for later. So you wanna make sure you have a way to construct your earrings after they're baked. Now the final detail would just be these little rocks at the bottom. I'm gonna take some of that gray granite that I showed you before. This is the Primo gray granite, one of my favorite colors. Um, it's a very nice light gray and it has different sizes of black flecks in it. So um, all I have to do now is just make a little pile, little random pile of uh, earth down here or rock that this cactus is sticking out of. And I've got my little gray there and then I like to texture it with that blunt end again. And this texturing also helps connect this gray clay to the background. So that's a good tip for creating texture and connection at the same time. Now I would do the exact same thing to this piece. I'd probably make my cactus, you know, going up the other leaning the other direction like I did, you know, these, these two kind of mirroring each other. I would do that, make sure I've got a hole. And then that would go in my baking pan in my home oven at 275 for 30 minutes. And then I would just go ahead and construct them, you know, with the jump rings and the earring findings um, like you see there. Can so, you talk about how um, whatever it goes in the oven, like it's going to come out, like it doesn't shrink, yes, like it doesn't, the holes go I sure can. Sizes. Yep. So Jen's uh, making a really good point again that however it looks when it goes in the oven, that's how it's coming out. So it's not going to shrink. It's not going to expand. It's not going to change. However big this hole is, and you want to make sure that that hole is going to be, you know, large enough to accommodate the size of jump ring you use. That's the size it's going to be. It's not going to fill in. Um, you want to get rid of fingerprints, debris, smooth out 
um, little bobbles and boo-boos and make sure if there's an air bubble showing that you could poke that with a needle tool. So um, I can pull this up with my, with my knife tool, just gently slide it off and that's ready to go on the baking pan and be finished later into um, earrings. So we've got about 10 minutes. If anyone else has a question. Can you talk about <laughs> um, what if you don't, what if you wanted to add a whole after baking? Okay, if you don't add the whole pre-baking, um, you can always add holes later in baked clay with a Dremel drill or a spring drill or a pin drill. And those are all sort of more mechanical. And in the case of a, a Dremel tool, it's an electrical device that has teeny tiny drill bits. Those work just slick as can be to drill out um, holes in baked uh, oven baked clay. And I have for many, many years used a Dremel tool to uh, drill holes later because it drills just such a super neat hole. Another thing I like to do if I'm pre-drilling before baking, I always go through the front and then I just really gently go and turn it over and go through the back just to make sure that there's not a little lip of clay around the edge. And you always wanna stay back from the edge of the clay, um, at least an eighth of an inch, to make sure you have a secure hole that's surrounded by clay that you can finish into you know, functioning um, jewelry pieces and make sure they're nice and strong. Can you talk about what you would bake those on? Sure, I would bake, um, I would bake this right on this same pan. I have a silicone um, baking mat on here. You don't have to have that. Um, I would bake these right on, the, on an oven bake pan, just like that. Um, if you want to create a barrier between your baking pan and your clay pieces, um, because maybe you have to keep using your same pieces, you know, for pizza and cookies and you don't want them to taste like clay. <laughs> you can always put down a barrier of aluminum foil. You can bake on glass tiles. You can even bake on paper um, because it won't um, catch fire at only 275 degrees in your oven. So you can create a barrier over your baking pans with aluminum foil or paper, or you can use glass or ceramic tiles to bake on too. So. And can we talk, there's a lot of questions about home oven, <laughs> so we can just yeah. a recap. All right, well, Maria, why don't we go to front facing so I, people can, um, so I can talk to my people. So, okay, about, about ovens, is that where you want me to start, yep, Jen? Yep, okay. Yep. <laughs> yes, you can bake in your home oven. Just make sure you use an oven thermometer and that you're monitoring the consistent temperature of your oven. So if you have an oven that you've never used before for polymer clay, put an oven thermometer in there and check it every 10 minutes or 15 minutes and make sure that the oven is not spiking up and down in temperature. Make sure it's holding a consistent 275, which is what we would want for these projects. And um, some people just, some polymer clay artists put a oven thermometer in there and it lives in there forever and ever. And they check their oven every time they open the door to make sure it's 275. Um, you can use your, your kitchen oven, or I have a dedicated craft oven in my studio um, that I check it every single time to make sure no one changed it from 275. And um, I use it in a well-ventilated area. And um, I just turn it on and I use a timer to make sure that I'm getting um, it's the time and temperature that create the, the most strongest product possible. And so um, you want to follow the manufacturer's instructions to a T when you're baking. Now, here's something interesting about oven baked polymer. You can bake it multiple times. You can bake it and add raw clay to it and bake it again. And if as long as you keep your oven temperature consistent, um, if you're using Primo or Souffle, it's not gonna change color as long as you're in control of your oven temperature. So you can bake multiple bakings, especially if you're making a project that's really elaborate and you need to add um, pieces on you know, over time. Um, have, did I cover the baking yeah. there, Jen? <laughs> can you also talk a little bit about how you know when it's done? 
how you know when it's done? Well, um, the, the, the instructions are very specific and we say with pre modes of play, we say 30 minutes per quarter inch of thickness. So you, or less. So if you have a piece like this, it needs to go 30 minutes and then you know it's done, okay? It's, and pre modes of play are, can be a little bit flexible and that is fine. They're super strong and they can be flexible, but it's still gonna bake up hard like that, okay? Um, so if you have thicker pieces, you need to measure them if they go over um, a quarter inch of thickness, then for every quarter inch, you're going an extra 30 minutes. And that is all over our website, um, sculpey.com, and it's all over the packaging. And um, also, you know, that's how you get started. And then you just know over time that you build confidence and know that you're baking your pieces to perfection. So can you talk a little bit about <laughs> storing your clay? Yeah, let's talk about storing. Okay. Um, I keep a lot of bins in my studio that are actually, um, Jen, can you help me with some plastic numbers? Um, number five, number five uh, plastic. It has that, you know, recycle thing with a five on it. That is, um, completely compatible with polymer clays and you can keep them like uh, once they're open like I would just lay these in there in a plastic bin and the reason I keep them in a bin at all is because I just want to keep them clean I don't want dirt and dander and animal hair to get in my clay and so I might even store them sides touching but put them in a plastic bin and then cover it with the lid and that will keep it free of dirt also, you can wrap your open bars of clay in kitchen wrap, um, cling wrap, the clear cling wrap that we use in kitchens. You can wrap them all up with that. Um, you could put them in plastic baggies. That works well too, if you have open bars of clay that you wanna protect and keep clean. And you wanna store them at um, a place that's less than 90 degrees. Um, our, our clays bake perfectly cured at 275 but you don't want to, you still need to store them at less than 90 degrees. So in the summer, I'm careful about buying clay and getting it home and getting it in my air conditioned studio um, before it has a chance to reach 90 degrees or higher for any length of time, because that's where the curing process actually starts because we're working with a heat activated product. Um, so yeah, keep it dry and clean and cool and it will have, um, a, sh a shelf life of a really, really long time. <laughs> Can you talk about if someone wants to do a post earring instead of fish hooks, how would they attach? Them? Yeah, so if you want to do a post earring, great question. Let's say you want to uh, attach a post, you would bake it completely. And then I like to use a silicone based glue, um, such as E6000 or Goop. Those are both silicone based and I would apply the post with one of those glues and then make sure it's super flat and has time to dry completely before handling it. Um, that is one way to do it. Sometimes people like to put the post on the back while it's raw and then put um, some clay to hold the post in place, but then you need to really consider how you're gonna bake that and keep the post up if you embed it in clay. So I would rather use silicone glue and put the post on later. Same for pin bars. Um, or barrette findings like a hair piece, um, I would glue those on later with silicone glue. Or you can also use um, gel um, rapid setting glue like fast drying. What do we call that? Well, we use Loctite. Glue. Like Loctite gel glue works out really well for holding things in place and, and dries quicker. So, okay, any other questions? Cause we're, we got one minute and I need to tell everyone bye. <laughs> okay, thanks again for coming. Um, I love that you've taken time out of your day to do um, a crafting project with me. Please check out some of the other uh, jewelry uh, classes that Michaels has going this whole week focused on jewelry making. If you post to social media, please use the hashtag Sculpey and hashtag how do you Sculpey and also use hashtag Michaels and hashtag make it with Michaels and we'll be looking for your projects out there on social media. So I hope to see you again soon.